It sounds like it's too loud. Here, we'll go down. That sounds better. Okay, picture unmute. All right, now let's zoom in here. And we already filled this page in, didn't we? We did fill this in. My notebook doesn't have it, but we filled this in last time. So let me just, this is where we left off. Okay, so we were talking about this study, pretend. We're talking about observational studies, and this was an extreme example of confounding here. Let's make this look better. All right, and uh, what we said was, suppose that people who carry lighters were found to have a higher incidence of lung cancer. Is an extreme example to illustrate confounding here. So we said, hmm, if lighters caused cancer, how would they do it? Hmm, we said maybe some toxic fumes from the lighter or something like that would cause the lung cancer. And we called this a, a causal link. It, it's a causal mechanism linking how this would happen. But we all know that's kind of crazy. That's why I picked this example to begin with. This would be a causal link. But we say, hey, this is an observational study. Those people who carry lighters, they chose themselves. You know, they chose it. Why? What's different about that group as opposed to people who don't carry lighters? There's some lurking variable, some difference between the two groups that may be the true reason we're seeing this higher incidence of lung cancer among the lighter holders. And we call that a confounder or a confuser. They don't happen in randomized studies because the only difference in randomized studies it would be the treatment, the lighters. The only difference between the people who carry lighters and people who don't would be the lighter itself. So we'd know that was the cause. But if this is an observational study, so there's plenty of differences. And we said, oh, the one that really comes to mind, people who carry lighters smoke cigarettes. So we said, oh, people, they smoke cigarettes. So we know that causes lung cancer. And it's a difference between the treatment group and the comparison group, people who don't carry lighters, they have a much higher percentage of people who smoke cigarettes. So that's a confuser, that's a confounder. How do we know whether it's the lighters that are causing this higher incidence in lung cancer or this confusing element called a confounder? And so we looked through here and when people, we said, well, hmm, so that's the causal fumes is the causal link or the lighter fluid right there. That's the causal link. And we said this smoking cigarettes is this confounder. And then people sometimes think, hmm, there's other, ins there's other reasons people get lung cancer. Would that confuse our results? So you might think, huh, people get lung cancer because of radon. That's at the bottom here. But that isn't a confuser because there's no reason to think that people who carry lighters and people who don't would be any different in terms of how much radon exposure they have. The radon has nothing to do with this, the lighters. So it's not a, uh, it, we have no reason to believe that would be the reason we see this higher incidence. We see these results. We see people who carry lighters have a higher incidence of lung cancer. We have no re reason to believe it. radon would be confusing our data. And same with age, and same with genetics. Unless it was the same gene that causes lung cancer that causes people to carry lighters. Kind of crazy. Okay, so we know that these are neither, and that's where we left off last time, correct? Neither, neither, and neither. So now we're in this situation where we have this observational data, and we don't know how much Pretend, we really were wondering about this. Y'all know it's the smoking and not the lighters. That's why I picked this example. But pretend you really didn't. Pretend to like, oh, wait a minute, how are we gonna tease out these differences? How are we gonna separate 
the effect of uh, smoking from the effect of carrying lighters. I mean, there's all these differences between people who carry lighters and people who don't. One of them is glaring difference is smoking. So how are we going to use, how are we gonna make the, how are we gonna be able to tell? So that's on the next page, let's turn the page. Um, all right. So, how can we determine whether it's the lighters or the confounders, or maybe some combination of both? It's a possibility. You know, could, but how could we uh, even separate the effects of one from the other, see how much it's due to one to the other? So what do we do? Well, think about it. What I say here is we break the population into subgroups along the confounding factor. We look at just people who don't smoke and then compare the lung cancer rates of those who carry lighters to those who don't. Same with uh, moderate and heavy smokers. And then if that difference um, disappears, we know it's not the lighters, it's the smokers. It's the smoking. So let's think about it a little bit more carefully. So pretend, I'll do this side this time, pretend you guys all carry lighters in your pocket, okay? You just divided yourselves up, the population. You're the lighter carriers, and you guys don't carry lighters. Now, some of you still smoke. You have carry matches. You still smoke. And some of you maybe don't smoke or don't smoke cigarettes. Okay, all right. Okay, we'll say. So you're still carrying lighters. All right, now there's this glaring difference. We know that the smoking is, is going to cause you guys to have a higher rate of lung cancer. If I looked at the whole group of you and compared you to the whole group over here, it's all confused, all mixed up because you're going to have a higher rate of lung cancer, regardless of the lighters because of the smoking. So how can we remember what our goal is? We want to make the two groups as alike as possible. So what I really want to do is, I can't go back and randomize the whole study. That would be one alternative. I could go back and do a randomized study and track people for 20 years, randomly assign them to carry lighters or not carry lighters. Yeah. But I have this data here now, and I want to make some sense of it. So what do I do? So I look at you guys, and I think, OK, I'm going to try to match you up with, with people over here. I'm going to divide you up into subgroups. And the thing that's really messing me up right now is the smoking confounder. So what I'm going to do is try to match you up along that confounder. That's to, so I'm going to make you a these two groups as alike as possible in regard to how much you guys smoke. So what I do, I go over here and I'll pick out the people who aren't smoking cigarettes. Right? I'll pick you guys out and then I'll pick out the people here who aren't, who are as much like those people as possible who also aren't smoking cigarettes. Alright? Now I have the subgroup. No one's smoking in either one. You guys are carrying lighters. You have the treatment. You guys aren't. And nobody's smoking. Now, I'll compare you. Smoking's out of the picture. So if a difference exists, well, maybe it is the lighters. We still have a difference. Pretend it might be the lighters. It could be another confounder. But we know mm, we still have to investigate this. But as is the case, the difference disappears. There's no difference at all in the lung cancer rates between the two groups. So you can see, oh, don't you see lighters must not have anything to do with it when you don't smoke. Lighters has nothing to do with it. Do you understand? Why would I keep going? Okay, so now I'll keep going and I'll think, well, maybe. It doesn't have an effect on people. It doesn't show up with people who don't smoke. Let, let, me, let me look at people who are heavy smokers. So I'll pick out, there's going to be a lot of heavy smokers here. You're all carrying lighters, right? So that will be an easy job for me to do. So you, and you're going to have probably a high rate of lung cancer. So I'll pull out the heavy smokers here. And I'll pull out the heavy smokers here. Lots of you are carrying matches. There's probably some heavy smokers. I'll pull them out too. And then I'll look at the rates. I'm going to have a lot more people over here who have we smoked, but I'll look at the rates. I'm going to compare the rates of the two. And 
then I'll see, okay, you're all going to get a lot more lung cancer because you're all heavy smokers, but does adding the lighter to it change things? It turns out it doesn't. So do you get the idea of why, how we do this, how we break into subgroups? That's, that's the point. Um, and see, it's the best we can do. And we don't do it just with one confounder, we do it with a, anything we can identify as a confounder. And sometimes, well, it's funny. What? My voice changed? Oh, too much smoking, huh? I sound like a, I think it is. It's like, I think I'm like channeling that smoker, the former smoker in me. Okay, isn't that weird? All right, now, what's <laughs> going on? Too much of an actress here, I gotta get out of the mode. Okay, <clears throat> now we understand that. Okay, so let's just keep going. And we gotta move a little quick, more quickly this time because we're playing catch up here. We are behind. We've had such great discussions, but we've got to catch up. All right, so let's go through some of these examples. Here's an example, pretend, that it's very similar. Pretend that in observational studies, we saw that smokers have a higher rate of liver cancer in observational studies. So there's two possibilities. Does that mean that smoking actually causes there's some causal mechanism in the smoke. It's actually causing an increased level of, excuse me, I think I said lung cancer, liver cancer. We know smoking causes lung cancer. Here we're talking about liver cancer. All right. So is there something in smoking, in the smoke, maybe some carcinogenic element, maybe nicotine that actually gets processed in the liver as well as affecting the lungs? Okay. Or... These people chose themselves, so is there some difference between people who smoke and people who don't? Some lurking variable, some mystery confounder. Something inside there. So we're wondering, is this the case? Or is there something in here that's different about people and that smoke? So you think of it like you'd have a list here. Okay, I'm gonna think, what's different about people who smoke, that's my treatment group, and people who don't smoke? That's my comparison group. I'd make a list. And are any of these characteristics, could they be, could they fit in here and be the true cause of the liver cancer? And also, if, if we list them here, a difference between people linked to this smoking. Something about smokers, besides the fact they're smoking, that, that's what I mean about it has to fit. Here is a difference between these two groups. Are, are, Ideal is to have no difference between these two groups except for the treatment, treatment control. No difference. But in observational studies, we get plenty of differences. So, guys, think about, shout out some characteristics that might cause liver cancer that smokers do more than non-smokers. Drinking, good one. Drink, they drink more. Let's test it. Drink less. Let's see if it fix, fi fits in that box. Drink less. If it's not on this list of differences, it can't be a confounder. It has to be some difference. Okay, so drinking. Drinking alcohol. Let's see. Drinking. Y'all agree that smokers, smoking and drinking does go together very nicely. <laughs> oh, I remember those days. Okay. Oh, looking back. Okay, now, makes me want, makes me thirsty even thinking about it. So, all right, now, let's think. Okay, that's a prime culprit, a prime candy for our confounder. It fits everything. So now, what are we going to do? Is it this drinking? Or is it the smoking? How are we going to figure this one out? So we think again. Hmm. This is the problem, this drinking. We don't have the same. We don't have the same distribution among the smokers and the non-smokers. So we have to handpick people to make them the same along that drinking. So here I'll pick you guys 
as the, what's our treatment group and our control group? The, we're talking about what? The treatment, in this case, is smoking. So you are the smokers, you guys are the not smokers. You guys are drinking a lot more, right? So how can I tell if that's the reason you're getting a higher rate of liver cancer or something else? So what am I gonna do? What do you think I'm gonna do? Pull out of this group, what? People who don't, you're smoking still, you're all smoking, but people who don't do what? Drink. The non-drinkers in here, I'm gonna pull you out and I'm gonna compare them to over here, who? People who what? Some of you drink, none of you smoke, but some of you are still drinking, right? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna pull out the people who aren't drinking here. Now I have two groups that are like, the treatment are the smokers, non-smokers, same, you're the same, that's the, on this variable, I think's mixing us up. And I'm looking, I'm gonna look at your rates of what? Liver cancer, right? If they're the same, if they're the same, even though you're smoking, it doesn't, the smoking's not doing it. You're all smoking, you're all not smoking. If you have the same rates of liver cancer, it's not the smoking, it had to have been the drinking, right? Do you understand? No one's, we can do the same thing with the heavy drinkers. Pull you out of here, the heavy drinkers, you're smoking, you're gonna have a lot of heavy drinkers here too because they go together so well, but you're gonna have heavy drinkers here too. We pull them out, we compare likes to likes, and we see what happens to our liver cancer rate. You know, if, if it remains, if there's still some, if, if there's still a difference, well then we have to investigate further. It might be the smoking, because it's not that, you know, you, so, but, do you understand? You, I see blank faces. Maybe I have to write this down. So, the likely confounder, let's write it down and then we'll move on, we'll do some more. The likely confounder is drinking. This is what we think fits in here because it's both, what, a difference? Between, it's both a difference between smokers and non-smokers. Smokers drink more. That's our treatment, and non-smokers. And it has to be both. It's a difference between them and a known cause of living, liver cancer. We want to eliminate that drinking from the picture. Okay, so now, to figure out whether what it is, to separate out the effects of um, this confounder, it's confusing us. So let's break the population, break the population into subgroups along that confounding factor. Where the confounder drinking is the same between the treatment and control groups. The confounder drinking is the same within each subgroup. It's the same between treatment and control, between smokers and non-smokers. So you can see smokers and non-smokers. And then if the difference in liver cancer disappears, well, it wasn't the smoking, we have smoking and non-smokers. And there's no difference, so it couldn't be the smoking. Okay, so we would just go like this and we'd say, okay, everybody's a non-drinker. Here's one group. And then we'll go moderate drinkers all the way down. We can do as many groups as we want. Oh, this is messy, I'm sorry. Let me zoom out a little bit. Non-group drinkers, and then we'll go all the way down to heavy drinkers. We just want them all the same. Okay, nobody's drinking here. Now, what are we gonna do? Compare smokers to non-smokers and see what happens with the liver cancer. So we'll compare, everybody's not drinking, and we're gonna compare smokers versus non-treatment versus control. Oh, 
on their liver cancer. You know, on liver cancer rate. That's what we're going to see. Who has a higher liver cancer rate? And we'll do the same with the heavy drinkers. We still have treatment versus control. Treatment versus comparison group. And we'll see if it, it holds up or not. If it holds up, well, then we have to move on to the next confounder. We still don't know what's smoking. We just keep going. It's a lot of work. But we were lucky in this case. You know what happened? In this case, no difference. So if there's no difference, we know it couldn't be the smoking. Because these people are smoking a whole lot, and these people aren't. And they have no difference in liver cancer rate, even when we do whatever. All these people have a low... You gotta, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have a tendency to just over explain. So I'm gonna try to stop doing that because we're behind. So just raise your hand if you don't understand so I'll know to over, I'll know to explain again. Okay. Now let's move on. And our next one is. Oral contraceptives and cervical cancer. So suppose studies show that there's this, there's this people who take birth control pills have a higher rate of cervical cancer. Now this is clearly not a randomized trial. You can't even turn it into one. Who's going to volunteer to be randomly assigned to a birth control pill or a placebo and then nine months later find out, woo, -hoo, I was in the placebo group. No, not going to happen. So this one has to be observational. So what do we do here? So we say, did the pill cause the cervical cancer? Maybe. Possibly. This is the only kind of data we're going to get on this type of experiment. If so, how? Is there something harmful in the pill or some, something? That some, you know, there's certainly hormones in there. Did they cause cervical cancer. Or, before we even go there, because it's not randomized, let's think about people who take the pill versus people who don't. There might be something else about people who take the pill that we know caught, that could cause cervical cancer. So that would be in this mystery box. This would be the confounder. But it also, it's not just any old cause of cervical cancer. As I said before, it has to be a difference between people who, so I think it's helpful, like on an exam, people who think about the treatment is the pill. Treatment. And the comparison group is people who don't take the pill. No pill. To figure out what's a confounder, because this is where people get mixed up, you've got to list these differences between the people and see if there's something else about them that could possibly be doing this. It has to be something else linked to. That's why it's not necessarily something that's causing them to take the pill. It's just linked to pill users. It's something that they do that could be the real culprit here. So think. Hmm. First, just think of differences. What happened? Shut them out. What's some differences between people who are on birth control pills and people who aren't? And let's see which one could fit in there. Menstruation messed up. Okay, so their cycle's messed up. That's it. That's it. That happens. That's cycle messed up. And cycle nice. Cycle good. Okay. Actually, that could. Because a cycle messed up could be an indicator of cervical cancer. Whoa. Yeah. That's a possibility. Cycle messed up. They could have some other thing wrong with them that's messing up their cycle that's causing cervical cancer. That is a candidate. Yeah? Anything else? Go ahead. Yeah, that's another big one. This, but this is something interesting here. But what she said is probably more likely, and that's the people who, they're sexually active. And they're also what? what else? They're sexually, not only are they sexually active, but they're already, they're using the pill, so they're more likely to not use a condom, right? And this is an ST, this is caused by an STD, so it could be transmitted that way. So we'll just say they're not using a, so these people, they're sexually active, and these people, what? These people are using condoms more likely. And these people aren't, so they're doing unprotected. More likely to sexual activity. Mm -hmm. 
Should we, th should we think of both of these could work? Both of those fit in there. There's like, there could be a lot of them. Any other ones you can think of? Should we just test these out? Okay. I think they, I think in a real, when you're really doing this, you have to test out all the confounders, right? But we'll start with, so this one is probably more likely because a lot, some people are on it for this reason. <laughs> oh, I won't even tell you. Okay, so unprotected sexual activity. Let's check that one out first. Do you agree? Okay, so we'll stick that one in here, but the other one's a very good point. So we'll put this one in here. We'll say unprotected sexual activity. U-S-A. <laughs> U-S-A. All right. Okay. So now, I love the way that looks. All right. So now, what are we going to do? So, pretend we're trying, we're, so we're just dealing with this one now, and we're trying to make these groups as alike as possible. So we break into sub, we're, we're this, so we're going to break into subgroups. And this part is not, when we're, this part about breaking into subgroups, if you're a little bit hazy on this, you're going to understand this later on, and it's not really going to be on exam one. So just figuring out what a confounder is, what would fit in here, and that's going to be on exam one. So just don't get too worried if you get a little confused here, because this will be clearer later in the course when we do methods that actually do this. Okay, so we're going to break into subgroups, and we want to make this confounding factor the same. So we'll start with people who aren't having sex at all. Let's say no sex or no unprotected sex. To make it really simple, we can just say no sex. And then lots of sex. All the way down different categories, okay? Just to make it really simple. So, all right. So we have people here. Let's look at the no sex people first. Nobody's having sex in this group. All right, so it can't be this. And we're going to compare the treatment to the control. So we compare pill, people on the pill. They're in a lull. They're not having anything. Nothing's going on in their lives. They're in a dry period. And we're comparing dry spell or something. You know, I mean, they're waiting for the next. Or maybe they're married. <laughs> not having much long time married, I'm talking about. You know, you'll see. OK, so. <laughs> So compare those people, they're still on the pill, they've had their family, they don't want any more, but they don't want any more of that either. So they're comp you're comparing the pill users, <laughs> it's too silly, right? Com pill users to no pill. What are we comparing about them? What are we comparing? None of, nobody's having sex, so what are we comparing them? What are, you, what are we measuring? What are we measuring here? What's the, what's the whole study about? That the pill could lead to what? Yeah, so we're going to measure how much cervical cancer they get, right? Does that make sense? All right, so let's do that. So we're comparing the pill users to the no pill users and measuring their cerv cervical cancer rate, right? Comparing, I should have put it like this. It's easier to fit in. Comparing the cervical cancer rate of pill users to no pill users. Does that make sense? Okay. And then let's look at these people. Now, they're both groups are having tons of sex here. Tons of unprotected sex, you know, so they're going to, both groups are going to have, whether you're on the pill, you could easily have been having lots of unprotected sex, but you might not be on the pill. You might have an IUD, or you might just not, I don't know. You, but you're both having lots of unprotected sex, okay? And so you're going to both have a higher rate of cervical cancer. The question is, do the pill people have an even higher rate? That's what we're looking at. And so that's, we'll do the same thing there. All right. So, let's do that. So we have lots of sex, and we're going to compare the cervical cancer. These are, these are all dittos, believe it or not. That's what that is. The same thing. And in this case, if you're on the pill, good news. No difference. Does not cause cervical cancer. What that confounding element 
The huge one was the unprotected sex, but I think that that's another likely one too, that if you're already having a, a, a cycle that's uh, messed up, that indicates maybe something's wrong, and maybe you would, it's, you know, that um, taking the pill is an indicator that maybe your cycle's messed up, and that could be, for whatever reason, that could be causing it too. So that's a good, another confounder. You can have many confounders. And you can also, okay. All right, now you're probably wondering, and we have to speed it up, what, ooh, I want to give you some practice, exam one is coming up in two weeks, and I want to give you some practice on the type of questions you're going to face on exam one. So since it's a multiple choice, it's too hard for, on all of your experimental design questions are going to be multiple choice. So get out your eye clickers, and we are going to do this question as if it was on an exam together. Okay, so get out your eye clickers, and I'll show you what it looks like. It's going to be the same thing, and I actually pretty much copied it from an old exam, so you can get practice doing this. All right, so let's go over to the PC, and here it is. So uh, there's going to be some questions, and I want you to pretend the best way to learn is just to pretend it is an exam. Look, you're going to just participate, and it's going to give you... 75% of your eye clicker points, and you'll get, and the right answer is just a fraction of the remaining 25, so you'll still get a little more if you answer right as an incentive, but overwhelmingly, you should just think, you should just, it's so much more important to just really think about this as if it was an exam and answer. So I'm going to start it, because then it will help you on the exam. So just try to think about it, and I'm going to start this, and I'll read it together in case you can't see it. A study showed that infants living in homes that have two or more dogs or cats during the first year of their lives were much less likely than other babies to develop allergies later in childhood. Okay, so the first question is, what kind of study is this? So, did you think the researcher chose people to, do you think it was, a, you know, be born into families with dogs and cats? And, all right. <laughs> so, that's the first question. And I'm just, I think everybody's had a chance to answer, right? All right, still going up. I'll stop it, any, or stop it here. And let's look at this. Let's see what you answered. Cool, very good. It's an observational study. Now, let's move to the next one. And we'll just move to the next question. Why won't it move? Okay. Now, based only on the results of this study, do you think it shows that early exposure to pets actually, do you think it actually prov causes children to, to have less allergies? Do you think this treatment early exposure actually causes them? Is the real reason somehow causes them. It might, well, I shouldn't say. Yes, yes, the study shows it does. No, it only shows an association. It shows it might, it may or not, may not. Or here, what does it say? It shows that it clearly couldn't. It has to be a confounder. Which do you think it is? Did I start this already? I'm sorry, and start it, okay. This is great practice for you guys. You need it because we've got to move ahead too. All right, stop. Yeah, go ahead. Sometimes it gets clogged up. I should I should start it at the very start of the question. I'm sorry I didn't do that. Such a big class. I should have started earlier. Okay, so we're good. All right, so let's stop it and see what you answered. Great. Yeah, may or may not. We don't know. All right, so now let's move to the next one. Okay. All right, so now below are either confounders. We're just going to do this first one. I'm going to start it. So you can. We're just going to do this one. I'll give you a time until I finish reading it, but you can start clicking. Below are either confounders that confuse the study 
causal links or mechanisms that explain how something in the pets, maybe in their fur or something, provides a protective effect, or neither, has nothing to do with it. It might be a cause, but has nothing to do with pets or no pets. So, um, genetics. Infants born into homes with pets are more likely to have parents who aren't allergic. And so they're more likely to not develop allergies themselves. So that's the one we're voting on. Remember how to figure, you know. I'm not going to give you any more hints. I want to see how you do on this one. Okay, so we will stop it and let's check it out. Whoa, okay. That's wrong. <laughs> I was wondering if I didn't give you any hints whether it would be that way. Okay, so we are going back to the drawing board for a moment. All right. Okay, so back to the P to the uh, document camera and just a, I think you'll I should have given you a lead into this. And what I should have said was, and this is how you should think about it. Okay, is it that the pets, something about the pets are causing allergy-free kids, kids who don't have allergies, allergy-free kids, that's what that says. Oh, handwriting. Or is it something else about children who are born to families with cats and dogs that could be the real cause of them being allergy free. Okay, so it's something about kids who are born into houses with lots of pets. So this is really good for you because now like if you are on an exam, you think, okay, I'm just going to write a list. Kids born with pets, kids born without pets. This is the treatment, this work. Okay, what's another difference besides the, the pets might do it, but let's think of something else that could go in there. And if it's something else about kids, and what was the genetic, like kids, allergy-free parents? Was that what it was? That I asked genetics. The parents weren't allergic, that's why. Yeah, allergy-free parents. Non-allergic parents, however you want to say it. That's the genetic one. You know, if the parents don't have allergies, they might have a lot of pet, more pets. If they have allergies, allergic pets, allergic pets, Allergic parents. Are they going to have a house full of pets? No. So, if it has a genetic component, a heritable component, would that fit in there? Yes or no? Would it? Yes. Yes. So that would be a confounder. How many people answered? So a lot of people answered that, but more people thought it was neither. So, getting back there, one of them is going to be a causal link. That's going to go in here, and the confounder, we'll put it right in, do you understand now? Was allergic, allergy-free, non-allergic, allergy-free parents, the genetic component. They're going to pass that down. That could be it. Could have nothing to do with the pets. All right, let's get back to the, answer the other two questions, and we go back to the PC. All right, now I'm going to start this one. We're on this one. Okay, exposure to the pet's tree triggers a healthy immune response. So it might be that early exposure might trigger, okay, an immune reaction that produces protective antibodies, but without, ooh, ooh, typo, without the allergic sensitization. So it might do something like this, uh, Exposure, this early might cause a protective. So this one, what is it? A, B, or C? I think this one is... Okay. We'll stop it. Whoops. And we'll see how you do on this one. 
Good, 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 good. Yay for us. Yay us. All right, the next one is pollens. Chil well, start it. Okay. Children living in areas with high pollen counts are more likely. That's true. That could be a cause of allergies. But is it linked to pets? And this is really, I, I just lifted this from an old exam, so it's very similar to what you'll see. So, and you have a lot of practice exams, so this is the type of reasoning I want you to do. And if you get stumped, make a list of the difference between the treatment group and the control group, and I think that's going to always be one of the confounders. Okay, stop. And we'll look, and this is neither, and you all got that one. Great. Terrific. Now let's go back to the document camera. And um, this is one that was actually on your homework. So I think we're going to skip it for now. And I think so we can move ahead and get you ready for the exam that's coming up and move along. I'm going to post the notes with a full, nice handwriting explanation. This time I'm of chapters one and chapters two, and even chapter three, because we're going to try to cover that. And so we're skipping it in lecture right now, but you'll see it on the notes. And you did it in the homework, this example. So moving along. Now, on this page, sometimes uh, the experiments just have the cart before the horse. They're just kept cause and effect treatment and response completely reversed. And there's some examples here of this. And so these are ones where the cause and effect may be reversed. In other words, did the treatment cause the response? We're not even looking for a confounder here. This is so backwards that maybe they just got it completely flipped. And maybe the response, or do they have it completely flipped and maybe it's going in this direction, the opposite direction? Or did the response cause what they call the treatment? And this is such an interesting one, but since we're moving, since I really have to speed things up, I'll explain this one in the notes. And I want to go to the one that's really easy to understand. I'll fill in the rest, but this one you'll just remember, it's really easy to understand. All right, so let's look at this one, and I'll fill the rest in in the notes. So, a study showed that people who drink lots of diet soda are more likely to be obese than people who don't drink diet soda. Okay? They just, they just did a survey or something, and they found this out. Just a slice in time. They didn't track people who drank the soda, started off skinny, drank a bunch of soda, and ended up fatter. No, they just looked at people, asked them, do you or do you not drink diet soda, and looked and saw if they were obese or not. And they found there was this relationship between the two. So why they concluded this is kind of a mystery to me, but it's, I mean, it happens a lot. They concluded, the study claimed, I'm not kidding, claimed, hmm, what did it claim? that artificial sweeteners, that the diet soda, artificial sweeteners in the diet soda, something inside this diet soda, is actually changing the behavior of the people, setting up this craving for sugar, this is the causal mechanism that they surmised, and causing them to be obese. Hmm. Why? Just because it was, I guess, surprising, more likely to get published. But if we just use common sense, it's more likely, why can't you go the other direction? You're just doing a slice in time. You're not tracking these people. You're doing what's called a cross-sectional slice in time study. You're not like tracking them, doing a longitudinal study and seeing what happens to them. You're not giving them the diet soda and then seeing if this develops. You're just saying, hey, they both occurred. You could, or I think it's more likely. Why not? You know, it's more likely. to say, okay, you start off heavy or obese, that obesity, and you want to lose weight, so what do you do? You drink something that has less calories. 
that's an easier. Um, that's, that just seems more logical than this surmising some weird mechanism. So they, they're just reversed, that's all. You'll see studies like this, okay? Any questions on that? All right, so let's move on. And I'll make this nice, I'll explain these. This is a cool study, but I'm, I mean, cool, it's so funny. It's such a ridiculous one, but we don't have time now. All right. Okay, so now, a very common problem with um, a lot of even very well-designed studies, you may start off with this great study, this randomized, controlled, double-blind, beautiful, ideal study. But then some people drop out of your study, like these slackers, if you have to take a pill every day or do something every day. These people aren't going to, they don't keep up with the protocol. They drop out. And the question is, the people are, researchers are always faced with, do you include the people who didn't even, who didn't continue with the study? Do you try to find them and, and, and track their results too? Or do you just forget about them? Uh, this happens all the time. So let's think about it, all right? What we should do with these people. So here's a good example. It's a, it was a real study on this drug called clofibrate. And it was supposed to, and it was a great study, randomized, controlled, double-blind experiment. And these were middle-aged men with heart disease. And they were at very high risk for dying, for getting a heart attack and dying. And they wanted to see if this drug that had already shown to lower cholesterol, so they thought it was really going to work. I mean, it lowers cholesterol. They figured it was going to, you know, prevent some heart attacks and, you know, lower their death rate. Why wouldn't it? You really thought it would work. Everybody thought it would work. Okay. So what they did was they tracked, first of all, here's the clofibrate group. They randomly either put them in this group this is how many they put in here, and this is how many they put in the placebo group. They didn't know which group they were in. And then they tracked them for five years, and the death rates between the two groups, they compared rates, because there's different numbers, that's not a problem. As long as you compare percents, this is per 100. 20 per 100 of these people died on the drug, and 21 per 100 died on the placebo, and those, that didn't, that's not statistically significant. That was a tiny little difference, and it, they were surprised. Why didn't it help? Huh. So then they went back, and um, they realized not everyone took their medicine. So they looked at people who, they called them adherers, if they took their medicine, and they looked at them, and they said, and then they looked at the people who were non adherers, who dropped, who just, or lazier or something. Slackers just didn't bother. They, they, you know, they didn't take their medicine a certain percentage of the time. They just were very sporadic about it. And they did that and they said, hmm, 15% death rate here versus 25% here. Maybe we should use this comparison. You know, clofibrate can't work. Here's the people who took it. They have a much lower death rate. I think that some people argued, I think this clofibate works. So the question is, which comparison should you use here? And I want you to remember what I said is it contains observational data, which often can happen, that will then contaminate your study. So you have to be really, really careful about this. They split off here. These groups chose themselves. So these two groups chose themselves. So that can contaminate our study. We have to stick with it. Remember how important randomization is? So really, and it, it's really apparent here, because look here. You see the same difference here. I mean, these people aren't even taking a drug. They're just taking a sugar tablet. I mean, and look at this dramatic difference. Are you going to argue that a sugar tablet prevents heart disease? Because look at how fewer people die. I mean, there's clearly what? Some difference between people who chose to follow the regular protocol, they're probably just more responsible in all their lives, you know, more... They're going to be different groups. People who regularly take it are going to be probably 
also responsible about their diet, responsible about their exercise, more likely to be, their sleep, lots of other habits that could contaminate our results and clearly do. I mean, this right here. So a lot of people want to compare it. Here are these two. That's not terrible, but it's best, as we saw before, to stick to the original randomization. So I'm just going to say, and you'll, it's best, you certainly don't want to compare 15 to 25 or people who stuck with it to everyone. That's going to be two groups. I can see looking at these, and usually you'll get about the same thing, but it's best to compare everyone to everyone because you don't want to diverge from that original randomization. As we saw, it's, you can introduce bias. So um, best to compare everyone who was assigned, because they were randomly assigned, and these groups chose themselves. Best to compare everyone, the total, in treatment, that's the 20%, to everyone in the placebo group, in the control group. Because you, want, you don't want to, any other comparison is self-selected people. Everyone in uh, the placebo group. I'll say in the comparison group. And that's the 21%. And um, it's interesting to look at this stuff, though. Now, another reason why it's best to do this is so you won't fall into the problem of making this comparison when there's no placebo. So let's pretend that the same experiment, this was an experiment where it was impossible to have a placebo, like so many are, like um, on exercise. So suppose the above data came from a study where it's impossible to have a placebo. Like, for example, a study to see if exercise prevented heart attacks. Then how would we know who was an adherent and who wasn't in the control group, in the comparison group? They were, because how could you tell who would have adhered if they were given a placebo exercise? I mean, you can't have a placebo exercise, so you can't tell who would have been in this group and who wouldn't have. So your only choice is to compare what? Let's look, this is, could be an exam question, so here would be your choices. And what does this one say? You should compare only those who actually exercised. That would be only those who actually exercised. That would be this group, 15% versus that group. Do you think we should do that? No. These are here. Do you understand this is, this is off? Do you understand why? You're, if you compare this group who actually exercise, you're comparing a group of really responsible people who self-selected to everyone, including the irresponsible people. That's not fair, is it? Is it? It's going to be biased towards your study, and it certainly is. How about you should compare everyone assigned to treatment to everyone assigned to control. Otherwise, the treatment group might consist of a different type of population. Subjects who are adherers, who take better care of themselves. Not only are they sticking to the exercise program, but they're doing other healthy habits that could be the real reason for, could contribute to the lower death rate. So you have to compare this to this, same as we did above. Do you understand? This would be the 20% versus the 21%. I think we should do this, but let's just first read the last one before we, on an exam, you should always read all of them first. So we penciled that in, let's read this one. This one says, you should compare those in the treatment group who actually exercised, that's them, the 15%, to who? To those in the treatment group who didn't. No way. Uh-uh. That's the worst. Because these people divided themselves up. They're the only thing that's different about this... No. Why did I say that? Because, what, how did I explain who didn't? Since both groups were given equal encouragement... Oh, it sounds good. Both gives, groups were given equal encouragement and training in the special exercises. You'll hear people argue this. That's, but this is bad. And you know, I hope you understand why. Questions? 
All right, so let's move on. And, all right, we're almost done. Then we can start the next chapter. And please interrupt me if, you have in, if anything seems a little confusing. Well, paradox, this is going to be very confusing. It's, that's why it's called a paradox, right? It actually isn't that confusing. This is an example of an observational study that says that is so mixed up, has such a strong confounder that the direction of the effect is the opposite. I mean, this is saying, like, um, actually, we saw one like this with the randomized study. We saw that, what was it, hormone replacement therapy, we thought it was going to be good for uh, women and help them live longer, but it was terribly confounded because the healthy women were the ones who were taking it. And then when we actually did a randomized study, the effect was the opposite. It hurt people. It caused them to die sooner. So that sort that was a pair. That this is an example uh, similar to that. Okay, but we have the we have all the numbers here. Okay, so this is back in um, 1973. Um, there was an investigation to see if uh, Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley, was discriminating against women. There were lots of, you know, just uh, unequal, unfair standards in, co in colleges, and they were looking across the country to see if where discrimination was occurring. And this glaring example happened, and it looked like, okay, so this is in the graduate admissions. Uh, 8,442 men applied, and 4,321 women applied to graduate school at Berkeley. And 44% of the men, but only 35% of the women were admitted. So first of all, first people said, hmm, unequal numbers. Of course there's a higher percentage of men, because there's more men. So we know there's some, is that right? No, because we're comparing percents. So percent means for every 100 men in there, in this group, 44 of them got admitted, whereas for every 100 women in this group, only 35 of them did. So just, I should note that again. Note, comparing rates instead of the absolute numbers, rates, percentages, takes care of unequal sample sizes. So that's not a problem. All right. So now let's move on. Let's we think, hmm, first ask yourself, was this an experiment or was this an observational study? What do you think? Observational. observational. Definitely it wasn't. People didn't choose who was going to get in. I mean, people did, but they didn't set up an experiment, choose who was going to be a man and who was going to be a woman. woman. The treatment here is, treatment is, um, we can put it down here just so you can see this. Is it, is it because you're a man? That's like the treatment. It's because you're a man you get a higher admission rate? Are they favoring you just because you're a man? Is it sexual discrimination that you get a higher, that you're, are the men admitted at a higher admission rate? Because the mechanism here is discrimination against women or they're favoring men? It shouldn't be men, it should be males, not just one man. Do males have a higher admission rate? That's the treatment, that's the response. And obviously pe people aren't randomly assigned to male or research don't, researchers, researchers don't assign sex. So, or is there something else? About the men, not because it's not discrimination, something else that's leading to a higher admission rate. Hmm. But it's linked to the men. Something about the men. Linked to males. Difference between the males and the females. So this is, this is... Okay, so let's go back here. It's an observational study. All right. Observational, so it could have confounders. And assuming that they're equally qualified, and there's no reason not to, is this evidence of sex bias? Are we sure this is happening? No. 
We don't know this is happening. We don't know it's sex, it's bias. It could be some confounding element. So it could be, certainly it looks like it might be, but since it's observational, and it would be true if it was non-random too, but since it's observational data, there could be confounders. Okay, so this is the situation that we're in. And actually, they weren't even looking for confounders. They were just thinking, they were assuming, this is kind of interesting, because the uh, people who are investigating this were assuming that it was this situation, that we did have sexual discrimination going on, that the guys were getting were being favored. But what they wanted, what they did was they broke it down by major because they wanted, they had different admission standards or different uh, procedures and they wanted to see which department was really doing the discrimination or some of them completely innocent or some much worse than others, etc. So they broke it down by major and these are just the top six majors. So this doesn't include all 8,442 8, men. This just totals to 2,691 and this totals to 1,835. But the pattern that you're going to see here is continues through all the majors. So let's pretend we say, okay, so we are, the, we are the investigators. We're trying to figure out which department it is that's discriminating. So we start off with this department. This is the first department under investigation, the first major. And we see, now we're going to compare numbers or percents. We're going to look at these percents. And we're going to say, are they discriminating against women? And you probably would be shocked if they're discriminating against anybody. Who are they discriminating against? Males, look at this. This is pretty dramatic. They're favoring women. So you say, whoa, major A. Well, there's got to be some other major that's, that's doing the opposite, even worse. So we, they kept continuing, and they looked at the next one. They couldn't, no, this is pretty close, but still, if anything, it's women. And they went a little favor, pretty close, close, da da da, you know, close. And they couldn't find any major that had significant discrimination against women. In fact, they were favoring women, the only ones they, that had big discrimination. So what's going on here? Paradox. That's a paradox, they thought. That's why it's called a paradox. But what's going on is that these groups weren't randomized. So there's another difference besides just their sex. And actually, it's the major that's the confounder. If you look at this carefully, you'll see that these two majors are harder to get into. These majors are harder to get into. I mean, easier to get into. I'm sorry. Easier to get into. Look at this. Sorry. The majority of the people who apply to these majors get in. So aren't they easier to get into? Yeah? Okay. Now, look. And aren't these majors harder to get into? This, this one's really... Aren't these ones all harder to get into? The, the majority don't get in. Only about a third, of, you know, third or less get in. Now, let's look at this. Most of the women, the vast majority of the women, in fact, this is about over 90%, over 90% of the women are applying to these majors that are harder to get into, where no one gets in as easily, where it's harder for everyone to get into. It's not sex, they're just harder majors to get into. It's not because of your male or female. So over 90% of the women are applying to majors where it's hard for everyone to get into, to um, majors that are just harder to get into, equally hard for men and women, to majors that are just more selective or harder to get into, as opposed to, look at this, these, whoops, sorry, these right here. Here we are looking at the numbers. And if you look at these numbers, there's what, 1,385 out of the 2,691. So it's slightly more than half of the men, whereas much less than half of the women are applying to majors 
that are easy to get into. Actually, easier for women to get into. Easier for women to get into. Okay, so over 50% of the men, we're talking about these guys, of the men are applying to majors that are easier to get into and actually are easier for women. They're favoring women. So the confounding factor is the major. Okay? It's not, you know, they're not looking at the sex here. They're not looking at the, you know, if it was completely blind, they didn't even see the name and the sex. You'd probably, more men would probably get in. So I think they're favoring women. Okay, so let's just write that down here. So it's not this. It's not, this would be sexual discrimination. No, it turns out to be a confounder, and the confounder turns out to be what? Excuse me, this makes it very hard to read. Okay, so a higher admission rate, and the confounder in the mystery box there is that Easy to get into majors have higher admissions rate almost by definition. So easy to get into majors are certainly of higher admission rates. And that's, for some reason, the men are applying to those more. All right, so we got, oh my gosh, we have to do, okay. We're gonna finish chapter three. You know what we're gonna do? Chapter three is really easy. So what I'm gonna do is this is another example of Simpson's Paradox. I will fill it, since you understood that one, this is much easier. I will post the notes to this one. I want you to read this. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend, this is really easy, pretty easy, straightforward. We're leaving behind experimental design and we're starting descriptive statistics. And we're gonna cover half of chapter three and the other half, I've already posted an instructional video for you if you wanna watch it, and the notes, I'll, step by step, and uh, I'm sure you'll be able to get it from those from one of those. Okay? So, let's just give you the... Okay, so now we're looking at... We're on a whole new section, descriptive statistics. We have a whole bunch of data and we want to summarize it. And we're going to summarize it numerically with the standard deviation, the mean, and the median uh, in chapter uh, four. But in chapter three, graphical summaries. So here's a graphical summary of the same, two graphical summaries of the same data, and the ones that we're gonna look at are histograms. So this is a histogram, because it provides a lot more information, and this is just a simple old bar graph that you're probably familiar with. So what's the difference? They're both depicting the same data here, which is the salaries of these NBA players a while ago. All right, so um, if you look at the bar graph here, it's just, what is it doing? It's looking at, okay, so these players are in between a quarter of a million and one million, and it, it's just telling you how many players are in this group. And here is between one and two. And look at this, look at this. Okay, so that's what this one's doing. As opposed to the histogram, which is doing what? The histogram, for one thing, has this horizontal axis drawn to scale. Do you notice how the distance is actually, the distance between, for example here, the distance between five to 10 and 10 to 20 are the same. But 10 to 20 is twice as big as that. You know, it's a distance of 10 million, a spread, and this is only a spread of five million, yet they're all the same, they have no meaning. Look, this is only a spread of one million, one to two, and this has three million. They're just categories here. Whereas here, it's drawn to scale. Okay, so that's the first difference. Histograms have the x-axis is always, and a histogram is always drawn to scale. And here, in bar graphs, they're not. They could be colors down here, categories. They're just, they don't have any meaning. The widths don't really have any meaning here. They're just categories. So the x-axis is not drawn to scale. So we're never gonna use this type of thing for quantitative data. You lose all your quantitative a lot of your quantitative information. So it's not drawn to scale. 
The other thing is that in a histogram, you look at the area of the blocks to see what percentage of the data falls within that. For example, okay, so this is a, if you look at all, the whole area, think about it, it's 100% of the players. And then you would look at the area of a particular block is what percentage of the players fall within that category. So uh, they use areas to depict percentages, and the whole thing adds up to 100%. Now, you can read this more carefully, but the point is, I think we'll understand it with a very simple example, and then you can go back and look at that. So let's look at a really, really, really simple example of a histogram, and we're going to look at this, um, we're just going to see how to read this histogram. All right, so reading histograms, and then the next section is drawing them, and that's the part you're going to, I'm going to leave to you. I'm going to fill this out, the drawing, and you'll see it on a video if you want. All right, so how do we read this histogram? So let's look here, and what is this? This depicts the final exam scores of a group of students. And, okay, so if this is 100% of the students, like area of this whole thing, you can just eyeball this and say, okay, I could look at this and say, hmm, what percentage of the area f is this block? This block, the area of this block, this rectangle, represents the people who flunked. And like, so I could just look at this and say, hmm, do you think half the people flunked? No, what does that look like to you? What percentage of the whole thing? Less than half, maybe what? A quarter or something like that, yeah. So you can just eyeball it and see that, all right? Now, how would you figure it out exactly? Well, it's a rectangle. The area is just the width times the height. So, let's get the width of this. The width of that is just 50 minus zero, so we'll fill it in here. That's 10, 50. Oh yeah, 50 minus zero is 10. 50 minus zero, that's on the tape, oh. Okay, 50 minus zero, yeah, it's being filmed, I can't edit. 50 minus zero, these are points, mm-hmm. Okay, 50 points. That's our width. And what's our height? Oh, it looks, that's halfway up. It's hard to read it. So what I'm going to do and what I'm going to do on the exam is put it right over that. And the label is percent per point. That means for each of the 50 units in here, there's 0.5% of the data. We're assuming this even distribution here. It's unlikely, but... Okay, so 0.5, and let's put percent per point. Okay, we've got that. Now let's figure out the area. So what are we going to do? We're going to multiply those two together. I know there's five minutes left, so I'm going to go for like four of them. All right, 50 points to get the area times 0.5% per point. And what do I get? 50 times a half is, half of 50 is 25. And look how this cancels out, and we get the percentage, 25%. And so whoever said that looks right. And so we'll do that with all of them. These intervals are all how, these are all the same, and what are they? How, how, what's the distance here? For each one of them, there are 10. So let's fill that in. All right. And let's, I'm going to put the, it's hard to read. These are both 1. This one is 2.5% per point. This is two, and this is one. All right, so now 10 times one is obviously what? 10, 10, I'm just multiplying it. And this one is also one, this is 2.5, this is two, and this is one. They're all the same units. So we can just, they're all rectangles. So this one is 10% as well. This one is what? 25%, this one is what? And this one is what? Okay, so let's fill it up here, and always fill it in here to make sure it makes sense. We could have made a little mis arithmetic mistake. So we have this is 10%, this is 10%, we have this one is 25%, we have this one is 20%, and this one is 10%. Now, I said the whole thing has to add up to 100, so that's the very first thing you should check. 
and does it. This is 50, 60, 70, 80, yeah, it's 100, so we're good there. So the whole thing has to add up to 100%, that checks. Now check to see that it makes sense. These are exactly the same size, these three, so they should have the same percentages. These two are exactly the same. Oh, wait a minute, these two say they're exactly the same. But are they? This one looks bigger, but they really are the same. And this one's clearly smaller, so it looks good to me. All right, now this percent per point is, what, what does this mean? This means for each, the vertical axis is in units that is in, labeled to mean that for each individual unit in here, this tells you how much. So if I asked you exactly how many students scored 65, you'd know that it was 1% of the class. Assuming an even distribution. If I asked you how many scored 73, it's in this interval, so you'd look up here at 2.5%. So is the number of students who scored 70 to 80 bigger or smaller than 0 to 50? Those two are the same, aren't they? So let's just write this in. How about 80 to 100? How about this group? This is 30% versus 25, so this one's going to be greater. Now you tell me what percent scored over 50? Well, 25% scored below, so this whole thing has to be what? Has to be what? 75. Now, I'm not going to, I don't have time, I'm going to put in the notes. What if I asked you, what percent scored exactly 53%? What would you say? What scored, what percent scored exactly 53? It's in this interval, so it's 1%. Do you understand? I'll write that in the notes. All right, now, um, uh, don't pack up yet. I just want to give you your, say grace after class is what we're doing. So, thanks. It's over.